Finding a decent USB hub or dock for your Mac can be a pretty daunting task for a lot of folks these days. Not only do you have to worry about the quality of the item that you're getting, but also the speed or versions of the USB ports, which seem to be constantly changing. There's external display support that's become somewhat complicated. And then there's other port types and specs and power delivery and so on. That can all be overwhelming in itself. But on top of that, there are hundreds of different types of hubs out there. And it's easy to spend hours trying to weed through them, finding which one best suits your setup for the best price or just get decision paralysis. Well, let's see if we can't try and alleviate that, shall we? Today, I'm diving into this topic to help break down what to look out for and what all this stuff means and give you a practical look on how everything works and performs with the end goal that you can find yourself a decent hub that works for you and save yourself some money along the way. So with that said, let's get into it. Hey everyone, Kyle Erickson here. I've talked about USB hubs on the channel before in bits and pieces, but it's been spread out across multiple videos. My goal here is to try and consolidate as much as I can into this one with updated products for this year and hopefully make everything relatively digestible for everyone. Some of these products you've likely seen before and some not. I wasn't paid by any brands to use the products in these videos. They're just things that I've either found extremely useful myself or the best products that I could find to go through some of this material. I will have everything linked in the description if you're interested in these particular models, but you should be able to apply most of what's in here to any hub or dock that you're interested in. So we're gonna start off with some lower budget options and work our way through mid tier and premium, more expensive stuff. And along the way, I'll try and dig into all the different specs and what they all mean. So let's kick things off with some of the more inexpensive options. Where I usually like to start is around the $20 range because most of the stuff underneath this price is frankly just junk. Most of them are going to be non-powered hubs and have poor build quality, and a lot of them are USB 2.0. USB 2 is a super old version of USB that was released all the way back in the year 2000 when computers look like this and has a painfully slow maximum transfer speed of 480 megabits or 60 megabytes per second. Just to put that into perspective, a single high-res photo or a decent sized PDF will take around 0.2 seconds to transfer, a five minute standard definition video will take around two seconds, and a 30 minute HD video will take roughly 25 seconds. At minimum, I'd start looking at ports with USB 3.0, which have a transfer speed of five gigabits per second or 625 megabytes, so about 10 times faster, meaning that most of those examples that I just gave are going to be instantaneous. A USB 2 can be good for some things like using a keyboard and mouse, but outside of stuff like that, it's pretty useless in my opinion. USB 3.0 is a lot more functional and usable for most things. And around that $20 mark, there are some great options. A lot of these hubs are non-powered, meaning that they'll rely on your Mac to power the hub and all the accessories, which can tend to cut out if you have multiple things connected. But the one thing that I found recently that I love in this price range is this Oracle 6-in-1 hub. I've used a lot of Oracle products in the past and had great luck with them. But the thing that I love about this hub is it has a really nice metal housing and solid build construction, which is definitely something that you want in any hub. But it also has one USB-C and three USB-A ports an HDMI output, and most importantly, 100 watts power delivery. That HDMI outputs at a max 4K at 30 hertz, which I'm not super fond of, and we will get into that in a bit, but having 100 watts power delivery at this price would have been unheard of a couple of years ago. This is pass-through power, so what that means is you'll take your power source or adapter that you usually use to power your MacBook, and you plug that into the designated port on the hub. That allows you to still supply the same power to your laptop, but it also provides power to all the accessories they have connected as well. Things like SSDs and hard drives will usually require some kind of powered solution if you're connecting them to a hub. And because this is 100 watts, this is still gonna be more than enough to power any modern MacBook. Just be aware that if you have the 16 inch MacBook Pro with the 140 watt charger, this will bring that wattage down a bit, but everything will still work perfectly fine. Now, on some of these hubs, you might notice that instead of USB 3.0, they have USB 3.2 with the same advertised five gigabits per second transfer speeds. And while that might seem better or different, it's actually exactly the same thing. The people in charge of naming all these USB protocols decided to rename all the USB versions so that everything was easier to understand. And in the process, kind of made this into a giant disaster. If you do see USB 3.2 or 3.1 for that matter, accompanied by Gen 2, that's actually a different protocol altogether. In Apple's spec sheet, I believe they use USB 3.1 Gen 2, but the important takeaway in all of this is that it's almost always better to just look at the advertised speed and ignore those version numbers just so you don't think that you're buying a version that's better than it actually is. When we talk about USB 3.1 or 3.2 Gen 2, that will come in the form of 10 gigabits per second transfer speeds and that's really where the mid-tier hub range starts. 
10 gigabits per second is gonna give you pretty decent speed. You'll see a lot of external SSDs that run at these speeds. And for the most part, for your average person, this will allow you to do almost anything with no bottlenecks. I've talked about a few different anchor models that I've liked on the channel before that are in this range that come in around 70 to 80 bucks. And those are all great, but there's one hub for me in this price range that really stands out, which is a tough thing to do in this niche. This little guy is the Charge N Pro Ultimate Docking Station, and it also has a pretty solid construction. But what I like about this one is it does have 10 gigabit transfer speeds on the USB-A ports, but the other types of ports on here all have higher specs as well. For instance, if you take a look at both the SD and micro SD card ports, they're UHS-2 readers, which you almost never find in these mid-tier hubs. Usually those will be UHS-1, and it does make a pretty big difference if you use SD cards on a regular basis. Say if you're doing a lot of video work or taking a lot of large raw photos. UHS-1 has a maximum transfer speed of 104 megabytes per second, where UHS-2 maxes out at 312, so it is three times faster, and that can make a huge difference in a lot of folks' workflows that use SD cards. Now, I realize that applies to what's probably a small percentage of people, but the other thing that this hub has going for it is it has an HDMI port capable of 4K output at 60 hertz. So as I mentioned earlier, a lot of cheaper hubs will only support 4K up to 30 hertz, which if you do have a 4K monitor in this day and age, isn't usable in my opinion. The picture is just very choppy and it's not the greatest experience. If you're running a 1440p or lower resolution, those 4K 30 ports will usually support 60 hertz in those lower resolutions. So in those instances, they'll work fine. But in a general sense, I always look for 4K at 60 hertz, which this hub does have. Any good mid-range hub should have 4K 60, but one thing to look out for when we start getting into more expensive hubs or docks as it relates to to video output is something called Display Link. I went out and bought this adapter specifically to show everyone how this works, but you'll see some pretty expensive hubs out there advertising multi-display support on Macs, utilizing Display Link technology, not to be confused with Display Port, which is just a display interface like HDMI. Display Link works by compressing the video stream and transferring it over USB. You can almost think of them as a variation of a video capture card if you've seen those, and where a normal 4K HDMI stream would take up, say, 10 gigabits per second transfer speeds across the line, the same compressed display link connection would be about half that. They definitely have their advantages, but unfortunately they have even more disadvantages. So let's start off with the advantages. The first being getting around the display limitation with Apple Silicon. If you own a base M1 or M2 machine, those will only support one external display where the Pro chip support two and the Mac chip support four. This is a bit of a departure from Intel Macs where there was more support for external displays, but display link allows you to get around that where you can connect far more models monitors in extended mode. Another advantage is that you don't need a traditional display connection like HDMI or display port. Some of these come with plain USB ports or USB-C, so they're relatively easy to incorporate into your setup. Having said that, there's a lot more to setting these up than just plugging them in like a regular display connection, and this is where things start to go downhill. To start off, you'll have to go download the drivers to make this actually work, and while that process is all relatively easy and it's easy to install, there can be issues later on when you update Mac OS where it can potentially affect how all this works or even stop it from working entirely. Also, because that video signal is compressed, it can degrade your image so things may not appear as sharp and that whole process uses more system resources and as a byproduct introduces quite a bit of lag as well. If you try and use one of these while you're gaming or anything where you need low latency, you're probably going to have a bad time and the same can be said for watching content as well. Because this is so similar to a video capture device, you'll notice that if I go to a streaming service like Netflix, the image is just black and that's basically Netflix's way of preventing people from pirating video. It's sensing that this might record video and stopping it in its tracks. The point being that there's just a lot of variables and potential points of failure, which is why I generally like to avoid these at all costs. Still, there are some cases where if you really want to use a secondary external monitor for things like productivity, you might want one of these. And the only thing that I'd say there is just buy the display link adapters themselves without the hub functionality. Display link hubs are usually super expensive and most of them are offering pretty mediocre specs on the actual ports. In my opinion, they're just not worth it. And if anything happens where the display link functionality stops working, you're essentially left with a very overpriced basic hub. And for what these cost, you can pick up a premium hub, which is the final thing that we'll talk about today. With premium hubs, mainly Thunderbolt 3 or 4, you're usually starting at a couple hundred bucks with some exceptions. Thunderbolt 3 and 4 offer speeds of 40 gigabits per second, so four times faster than those 10 gigabit speeds on a lot of the mid-tier options or eight times 
faster than those basic hubs and essentially extend the high performance output of your Mac. Any modern pro Mac machine with USB-C will have Thunderbolt 3 or 4 support and it does bring a lot of versatility. While both versions do offer 40 gigabits per second transfer speeds, there is a difference being that there's a PCI data transfer requirement of 16 gigabits on version 3 and 32 on version 4. If that doesn't make any sense to you, it just means that high speed external storage devices like SSDs can potentially run faster on Thunderbolt 4. Having said that, I believe Apple does have that spec much higher than the required 16 gig spec on their machines, so the difference is a lot less than you might think. Drives like the one that I have in this Acasis enclosure will run faster than the internal drives on some of the new Macs, which means that you can treat drives like this just like you would an internal one, which can be pretty handy for expanding your storage on a Mac as it usually isn't upgradable. Another area where Thunderbolt 3 and 4 differ a little bit is display support. Thunderbolt 3 will support one monitor up to 4K at 120 hertz or 5K at 60 hertz, where version 4 supports up to 8K at 60 hertz. Although there is a little bit of difference there, basically you can plug almost any monitor into these and have them work to their full potential. On almost all of these premium solutions, they'll also provide some kind of power delivery, the difference being that most of them are in passive power like I mentioned earlier, but have their own power adapter that you have to plug in. I think that's worth mentioning because sometimes these appear as if they're small and portable, but do still have a pretty hefty power brick at times. The nice thing is, is that you don't have to worry about using a pre-existing power adapter with them or its wattage output. The one that I use on a daily basis is the cream of the crop, the Caldigit TS4. It's got UHS-2 SD readers, 96 watts power delivery. So again, that will power any MacBook. There's two Thunderbolt 4 outputs, three USB-C ports and five USB-A ports, all capable of 10 gigabit per second transfer speeds. There's display port output, audio output, and a 2.5 gigabit ethernet port. It's just an absolute beast. The TS4 is quite expensive. I think it's around 400 bucks, but if you don't care about all the bells and whistles, probably the best deal that you can get is on the Element Hub or the TS3 Plus, which I've also tried and work fantastic. And those are about half the price. There are some other cheaper options that are decent, like the pluggable five-in-one Thunderbolt Hub, but I prefer CalDigit when I start looking in this price range, just due to the experience that I've had and the overall build quality. Depending on what your needs are, I don't think that you can go wrong with any of the hubs that I mentioned in this video. One thing that I am excited for is Thunderbolt 5 should be right around the corner. I think it could release late this year, and that's rumored to have up to 120 gigabit per second transfer speeds, which would be wild. As new versions come out, I will try and find devices that support them and review them on the channel, but I know there's been a lot of info in this video in particular. Uh, I could probably make this three times as long if I wanted to, but I just wanted to give a general overview of the things that I think are the most important to look at and hopefully help some folks out. That being said, feel free to drop a comment down below and let me know some of the things that you look out for in a hub or a dock or some of the models that have worked for you. As always, if you enjoyed this video or found it useful, feel free to smush that like button. If you wanna see more tech related content or pair up and create a human pyramid with only two people, please subscribe. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next upload.